All right, now joining us on another episode of Tennis Channel Inside In, which brings you perspectives from all around the world, tennis sports and racket sports as well. We've got a special guest on this week's show. Uh, was a 10-year veteran on the WTA, had uh, four doubles titles, a top 25 ranking, played against some of the best and beat some of the best players of her generation. But since that time, has evolved in racket sports, now in the pickleball league and the NPL, the National Pickleball League, at the Champions Division and uh, tearing it up there. This is somebody that's won many, many medals uh, in professional pickleball, got to number one in the world, all three disciplines. Played last year for the Oklahoma City Punishers. Uh, joining us now on the show, a very accomplished racket sports professional, Beth Bellamy. Beth, welcome to the program. Hey, Mitch. Thanks so much for having me. Excited to chat with you, but I have to start first because I'm a fellow uh, Ohioan, so I know your roots start in Ohio. So starting there, I mean, that was... You know, again, I like the perspective of somebody that didn't necessarily grow up in a hotbed of tennis. So we can start with your upbringing in Ohio and what that was like as a youth and then ultimately how you found tennis and racket sports from there. Yeah, no, um, my parents um, both got into tennis and kind of brought my sisters and I to the courts. And I think we were really lucky in Ohio back then. It was sort of booming in the 70s, the tennis scene. And we had some incredible coaches come into our area. And I just really benefited by when I started off having one of the best coaches, you know, for foundational um, work, um, a lady by the name of Wendy Zimfer when I was, you know, I think maybe 11 years old or something like that. And um, her brother, like, was an NCAA champion and, and, and played at Stanford. Um, and so she was great and kind of got us going and, you know. Being from Ohio, we played some tournaments during the year, but it wasn't crazy like California or Florida where kids were just out every weekend playing. You could It was kind of limited what we could do. But I think that sort of instilled a little bit of an idea that, you know, you had to make your time on the practice court count. You had to make your time on the, you know, when you got to go to a tournament it was really special. It wasn't just like, oh, no, this again. And so um, I think it was actually a benefit. And luckily, because of the coaches that came into town, and I had another guy by the name of Tim Gullickson, who was, I mean, a Wimbledon champion, amazing guy. Um, he was at our club for a while after after Wendy and um, some other people that kind of came through, Pedro Gonzalez, who had been at Ohio State. So, so many great coaches in the area. John Cook, who had like, you know, 15 national champions. So I really lucked out and that I really didn't have to go to a Boletaries or you know, go live somewhere else. I was able to kind of make it work at home. And, and, and by the same token, there were so many good players in that sort of indoor tennis scene. So it was fun. Yeah. You bring up a good point growing up, you know, in, in the Dayton area, how you don't have the luxury of being able to play just for weather and also the uh, amount of matches that you make your times count. And I'm assuming you were probably also a well-rounded athlete. Were there other sports that you picked up as a kid? You know what? I really didn't play too many other sports. It kind of wasn't. There were some gals like that were my peers, you know, in middle school and things. They played like soccer, but it wasn't that big of a thing. Like the thing, you know, I mean, I, I'm dating myself, but a lot of the girls did like, you know, drill team or cheerleading or things like that. So I actually felt like I was one of the few people who really stuck with, you know, there were other tennis players, but yeah. like in my high school and in my middle school, I mean, I definitely was one of the only people kind of doing serious sports. Mm -hmm. And, um, yep. you know, sort of for practice along the same Ohio lines, I had to start when I started doing a little bit better because there weren't so many tournaments. I started playing some pro tournaments for practice. And that's really mm -hmm. how I got on the whole, you know, pro thing. It yeah. wasn't something that I was aspiring to really even. It was just like, oh, well, we can go play this other tournament that's not too far away. And it's a local qualifying for some pro thing. And um, that's kind of what started me down that path. Do you remember a time when you first felt you were taking tennis seriously, like it was a step up? Is there a moment in your young career? Because it, it happened pretty fast. By the time you're the number one junior ranked player, number one recruit in the country. Yeah. Was there a I time mean, growing up? You know, okay, so I have four sons and they all played like D1 tennis at, at big schools and everything. And I will just say, you know, so therefore they played junior tennis before that. And it's so different now. Um, it really was when I was playing, it was. I mean, an absolute opportunity. Every time I'm like, I was so excited to go to a tournament. I didn't feel any pressure. It was like, no way I get to go to, you know, I remember getting to go to California for the first time for um, a tournament that I won and they sent everybody to California. I was like, this is the greatest thing. And then I found out it was like, 
I could go to Italy and represent the U.S. if I did well. And I was like, get me on the practice court. So it was always like, an, you know, the idea of it being an opportunity for me and sort of the carrot was to travel to all these cool places. So um, I, I think it was almost when I was, I would say maybe, you know, in the 18s was the first time and I was, you know, one of the top gals in the nation at that point. But I had a lot of time to sort of adjust, you know, versus like being a 10 year old. And, you know, my son, Roscoe, who was really good in tennis early, you know, he was representing the US at age 12. And like, they had sort of picked him out. And I just felt a lot of pressure for him at such young age, whereas my thing was just way more, I would say organic, nobody was like, doing anything for me. I was just kind of doing it on my own. And luckily I had awesome parents that, um, you know, got me to where I needed to go. And, and it was super fun, but pro you know, probably uh, the first time I ever felt like I was really taking it seriously was, you know, my late teens, I would say. Did you feel like at that time, I mean, growing up, I, I bring up your accolades to say, you know, a couple state titles, you were a top ranked recruit, top ranked junior. Did you ever really lose? And what was it like processing losses? Because one of the things in tennis and other racket sports is players like yourself that just win at every level. And then you're eventually going to get to a point, it might be the pros where you have to process losing where you've never been used to that. So did you ever really lose growing up? Oh, I definitely lost growing up. And I mean, you know, I remember them still some of the losses, you know, more than the wins. Um, but it definitely is different. So when I, you know, by the time I went to college, my last year in juniors, I did very, very well. I was the top ranked, you know, girl in the nation. And um, it was also, like I said, I think I was probably ranked about, you know, maybe 90 in the world at that point, because I was, you know, duly <laughs> playing the pro scene just as an amateur. And yeah. um, so I did win quite a bit. And then when I went to college, our team, I went to USC um, as a freshman. Um, and then our team, you know, I played number one, on our team and our team didn't lose the entire year. And then I won NCAs that year in singles. And so, yes, the last few years I had built up a lot of confidence playing, you know, tournaments and, and having a lot right. of success. It was a big difference going into the pro tour and, and a big adjustment, just like, wow. I mean, I went from almost never losing to like losing every week, you know, uh, to the likes of, you know, Steffi Graf and, you know, Martina Navratilova. It wasn't like they were bad people, but it's still no. like, you kind of are looking at yourself going, well, what can I do different? And, no. um, that there's a whole nother aspect to that is you're kind of like now it's your full-time job and you don't have that balance that, you know, I really enjoyed. And I thought actually made me stronger when I was a junior tennis player, because, you know, I had a pretty well-rounded life. I, like I said, I didn't have to go live somewhere else. I had like normal school, normal family, normal social stuff. So once you jump into the pro scene yeah. and you're, that's everything, like you're now traveling all the time and you're not really with your peers, you know, the ones that you went to school with or college with, it's a big difference. So when you were, and we'll get to the pro stuff in a second, but I just wanted to bring up, you were the number one recruit in the country, top junior, having every letter and everybody mm -hmm. offer you a scholarship. Mm -hmm. What stood out about USC? It's a, it's a unique situation, right? No one, very few people listening can put themselves in those shoes, but we know following other sports, we do that, you know, there's top recruits and it's this whole thing. And even in tennis now, the business of recruiting is just so complex. But what was it about, USC, the state of California that made you want to be a Trojan? Let's see. Well, I did. I mean, they were one of the top schools and I think it's, it's pretty crazy. So I, I was very fortunate. I did have a lot of opportunities, looked at quite a few schools, probably went on like at least six trips, you know, to North Carolina, Stanford, UCLA, um, Northwestern was kind of my close to home, you know, being from Ohio, like you could drive to Chicago. Um, that was so I, my last three picks, I don't even know if like USC ever knew this, but it, it came down to USC, Stanford and Northwestern. And I mean, it sounds crazy mm -hmm. to people like, I, I guess, I, I guess people know how good USC is, but like to turn down a Stanford scholarship, that sounds insane to some people, but they didn't even have indoor courts back then. And I was kind of thinking, you know, I, I don't know how I'm going to even practice. And I, I was just concerned about some things at the school, even though I know Stanford's amazing. Um, I thought SC, I really hit it off with a coach, the, the late Dave Borelli, who was, I mean, mm -hmm. a real important person in my life. He helped me, you know, even after I turned pro, he was my coach for a little while. Um, you know, just had so many awesome recruits at USC. And I mean, you know, that really, I think having Dave, um, 
you know, his recruiting style and just getting, I felt really comfortable feeling like I could turn my game over to him and that I would just have a blast at the school and that I could still do the pro stuff, you know, you know like get to the pro yeah. tournaments that I need to keep my ranking up. And um, I think I made a really good decision because, you know, I ended up, you know, basically having a dream year that year and Dave was just amazing. So that was yeah. a big part of it. So you won the national title in singles and the team competition. Not many women have ever done that. Um, you beat Gigi Fernandez in the final match point down. <laughs> what happened was I played her. I beat her seven, six in the third. So the team events first and our team won the team event. And then the, the um, individual yeah. event follows on right after that. And she got okay. to the finals, which was, I mean, she's such a crazy talent, right? She has like 17 grand slam doubles right. titles. She's, she's amazing. And I had known her because of, of again, Pedro Gonzalez from Puerto Rico having been in Dayton. So he was my coach, like those latter, you know, teen years and Gigi would come to town. And I think we even played like a doubles tournament together before she was really good. So she was kind of a little bit of an upset to get to the finals there. That was, that was, you know, the beginning of her sort of showing how amazing she was. But so we have this crazy match and she's up six, four in the tiebreaker in the third set. And I end up winning eight, six. And it was just, I mean, it was, it was, yeah. I don't even know what happened. I can't even tell you, but um, you know, we both had a great tournaments. And then literally that night, because I already had decided to turn pro immediately after that, that night I got on a plane, went, it was in Albuquerque that we were playing the NCAAs and I flew to LA and then a red eye to France and played the French Open like two days later. So that was my first okay. tournament as a pro. So it might've been so you, in that French Open part that, you know, mm -hmm. people thought we played. So, so you knew that you were going to go pro, which is interesting. And you had already mentioned that you were in the top 100. You had had this experience, but you know, you get to the pro level and you've had these pro matches already, but there's obviously a step up in competition. It goes without saying, but as someone that lived it, what was, you know, the difference being on the court playing against the likes of Martina, Steffi Graf, Pam Shriver, these names, you know, Billie Jean King, these names, what did they do differently on the tennis court that people on the outside don't understand having not been there? What was so special and more, more challenging for you playing these players? I mean, a lot of it was just their size and physicality. I mean, like, you know, I played Steffi Graf and she, you know, th there was, there was something going around back at the time where she was doing, you know, four forties faster than Olympians and things like that. I mean, it was like, you know, I'm pretty disciplined. Like, you know, I can kind of take care of things on my side of the court, but some things you just can't control. And if your you know, opponent is six, one, you know, serving you off the court and just physically bigger, that, that was part of it. And Martina, if you recall, like around, um, you know, basically in the eighties, that was when she got really fit and she it was like this, you know, beginning of the whole sports science and, um, she was extremely, you know, just physical on the court. She's not that big of a person, but she's, she, you know, she just packed punch for every pound that she had. Um, whereas I think the years before that had been more like, you know, Chris Everett, who also got very fit, you know, during the eighties, but, you know, Chris, Tracy, like you could have some smaller, you know, mm -hmm. forms being out there and their consistency would win and their mental toughness. But then it started getting to be like these just weapons, you know, these people that can come in and, you know, just physically push you off the court. So that was the biggest difference, I think, than just playing, you know, college and juniors. The women's game now, if you've been following, it's, it's a lot bigger. <laughs> That's Absolutely. what I hear from players now. The size and strength is, is enormous. Uh, more, here with Beth, more here with Beth Bellamy on Tennis Channel Inside In and your WTA Pro now tearing it up for the National Pickleball League. Lots to get into on that end, but, uh, you know, you did have that 10 year tennis career, Beth, at the pro level, you know, reaching the top 30, winning a title and also doing well in doubles. Do you have any regrets looking back at your decade run? You were making a living doing well, but do you have any regrets for how things went or how you handled things as a tennis pro? I don't think so. I mean, you know, I definitely had my fair share of injuries, um, during that time. I think, you know, part of that is the you know, the toll it takes going from being, a, you know, a full-time student who plays pro tournaments here and there as like a special occasion versus being somebody who's out there playing, you know, 20, maybe more tournaments a year. And some, you know, some that, that would mean like sometimes you didn't come home for two months. So um, I, I'm, I feel really fortunate that I had that experience of being a pro. It's like so rare, right? Like, and it, like I said, it was nothing that I had really aspired to. It just kind of happened. So it wasn't a pressure filled thing for me. Like, oh my God, this is my dream. Um, you know, I was excited. I felt like I should take the opportunity, live it up. And, um, it was definitely hard, um, 
you know, it was, it, it was a little lonely sometimes. I'll be honest. It's, it's not everything it's cracked up to be, especially back in the eighties. Um, so it, again, I kind of did rely on my family and my, um, peer group, like my friends. And so I missed all of that, you know, cause that had been a source of strength for me. Like, okay. It's like one thing if you're out on the court and you're like, I really have nothing else going on, right? Like this is my life now versus like, yeah. you know, I'm going to go and I'm going to play this match and then I'm going to go home to my friends and my family and, you know, all the other stuff. It's actually, I think, better for people to have a little bit more going on. And one of the reasons, you know, that's that's kind of, so I said I turned pro after my freshman year, but I, I did continue on with school just because I like to have, you know, something else going on, like, you know, not put totally all my eggs in one basket, but um, so I was happy with that. And that's how I kind of got reconnected with my coach, Dave Relly. When I, when I first turned pro, I turned um, just to the tour for about two and a half years. And then when I would have been a senior in college, I moved back to California. I'd been at home in Ohio, moved back out there to train and and took a couple classes a semester for like three semesters in a row. And I trained at USC with Dave and the team. And that's when yeah. I won my first pro tournament, literally like three months after I moved out there, my first pro singles tournament. And so... Um, I think, you know, it was having Dave, you know, there as a, as a support system for me, you know, kind of just having a good balance in my life that, that really helped. Um, but no, I don't, I don't think I do have any regrets. You know, it was, it was a great experience. So. Did you have any challenges? Cause again, it's like the pro athlete thing and you lasted a decade, which is longer than most, but did you have any, I know it's kind of hard to say, but adjustments, any issues adjusting to civilian life once you were retired as a pro tennis player? Um, you know, I, I was worried about it. So I was really worried about it. Cause I was like, you know, what am I going to be? So I tore my ACL when I was 26. Um, so mm -hmm. that kind of was my last, I did it at the U S open. That was my last match. And so I went and I'm recovering from ACL surgery right now too. So it's, <laughs> it's pretty strange to say that, but so many years ago did that was rehabbing to come back on the tour. And then I hurt my shoulder. Mm -hmm. Um, right after that. So I thought I wasn't going to go into civilian life, but like always, I just was like, Oh, well, I'm an injured. I'm going to take classes. So I don't have a, you know, a ton of stuff to do. Cause I always knew I was going to try to graduate from college. And so what happened during that time when I then had my shoulder injury, I was like, well, I'll just finish up school. Somebody's trying to tell me something at this point, like I'm, you know, yeah. I must not be lasting out here. So, and that's when I found, um, I was at, I actually had transferred to UCLA cause I was kind of practicing over there. Everyone I knew at USC was gone. Oh. And so, and I'd lived in California. So it was kind of at UCLA, took a business law class and then was like, oh my gosh, this is what I was going to do before I got on this whole tennis thing. And, you know, ended up, you know, trying, going to law school soon after that and going to law school at UCLA. And so I was really thankful that I was super excited about that. And that was like, kind of took the place of tennis. I was like, this mm -hmm. is so fun. I, I mean, I know that sounds strange to some people like that, that. Why would that sound fun? But I really nice. loved it. And it was kind of what I had saw my had seen myself doing before the tennis thing. My dad's an attorney, my grandfather's an attorney. So like, it wasn't like I really knew what that meant at age 15 or 14, but I was like, oh, I'm going to do that. And then I kind of got onto tennis and, you know, turned pro. So I didn't really go to yeah. the distance there. Well, it's, it's a good story too. It also shows you the post tennis career can sometimes as we're finding out now with your pickleball career, but can also be very fruitful in that there's a lot of athletes, an underrated amount that discover passions, discover business careers, law careers, even medical careers, and uh, are, are fortunate enough to have had this successful run made money and then also be able to finance, you know, what their next plan is. But, you know, I know it, it's weird to say too, because you have this second life with racket sports. Uh, I know there's pickleball now, but there was a stop in paddle where it seemed like you just won everything for about five or six years on the mixed doubles team. Yeah, no. I, and, and I think, you know, I played singles and, and regular doubles too. One of my dear friends from pickleball now, Anna Shirley, and actually my partner, Natalie Bagby, who I play with um, in pickleball, we all played paddle tennis. And it was the version out here in California that's played that's, you know, it's kind of different regionally, but um yeah, we, we played the U S open Anna and I won the U S open in doubles and I won it and mixed with a guy named Scott Friedman. And then I won the singles. Um, but it wasn't very organized. Like there wasn't a U S open every year. It was kind of a very fragmented sport and such a fun sport. So many ex tennis players loved it, but it wasn't, you know, really as organized. That's what's so amazing about pickleball is that 
you know, I kind of found it and it's like, there's a whole organization and a million people, you know, already doing it. So a um, little different than, than paddle tennis. Yeah. So you found pickleball within the last six years, seven years. Oh, much more recent. Um, I started playing during COVID and. Oh, well, that was the first time you ever played was during yeah, COVID. Wow. Yeah. And, um, again, my friend, Anna, surely <laughs> she had been sure. trying to get me in a couple other people I had too. And, um, she was playing and basically just, you know, kept asking me to play. And I was kind of like still doing paddle. And then finally, you know, I said, all right. And I came out there and I was kind of like, this is weird. Like, but the, the thing is the social part of it was what got me. So I, I enjoyed being with my friends that were, um, you know, starting to move over to pickleball. And it was just, I always would hear people laughing out there. And I was like, this, this seems different, you know? So, um, just got drawn in and, and really have enjoyed it ever since. Yeah. And I feel like studying up on your game, there's not everything translate from tennis or even paddle to pickleball, but there's an element of your game, your versatility. You had played a lot of doubles uh, in the other sports, but mm -hmm. I know you were known for swinging volleys at a time when that wasn't a thing and just really good net skills. So I feel like the transition, it's not always going to work for every single tennis player, but would you say maybe your skill set on the tennis court was better suited to translate over to pickleball? I think that's fair to say. I, I mean, I will say, I think it was like, um, a benefit also sort of switching to the, to paddle tennis that also kind of changed my grips a little bit and got me used to the smaller court. So that was a good, even though I hadn't done that for seven years before, you know, I hadn't been playing really much paddle. Um, it, I think it was conducive to, to going to the smaller court and the, and the paddle, but yeah, I think you're right about my volleys, you know, because I think the top spin swinging volley is, is kind of like a really helpful volley in pickle. And that was very comfortable um, to me, even from the tennis days. So I agree with you there. So I'm going to walk a very fine line here, right? Because I know it's the Champions League, and I'm saying this in this regard. But what are some of the challenges being an aging athlete versus when you were young and in your prime, regardless of sport, but you're playing a high-level sport, you're, you're competing. But what are the challenges and things you have to learn about yourself, recovery, things that, you know, I know there's a lot of pickleball players that are over the age of 50, even older. But what are some of the challenges of being a quote unquote senior athlete that you have to manage? Well, I mean, let's see. I definitely think, you know, for me, I feel better if I'm out there playing. Like it actually, you know, just keeping moving actually is a positive for me. So, um, but I do a lot of, you know, training when I can um, just to keep my body, you know, strong enough to do what we need to do out there. Um, let's see. You were asking other challenges like physically or what, what, what did you Yeah, mean? I guess just kind of making sure that you manage your body and you were a professional athlete at the top of your craft. So I feel like a lot of people who are athletic, but not nearly your pedigree, take things like that for granted. And then they get to older in life. Like, well, I need to stretch more. I need to make sure I recover. That sort of thing is like managing athletic side. Of things. Yeah, I, I think I absolutely, you know, everyone should take that seriously. It's like, you're just going to feel better if you do. I mean. Again, I had mentioned I had hurt myself last year. I think, you know, when you get busy, you know, we've all at over 50 got a lot of other things going on in our lives. And so for me, I don't know if that's why I ended up hurting myself. You know, maybe I was like not, um, you know, <laughs> I was just maybe a little bit too busy to do the things that I need to do. Or it could have just been a fluke. But either way, like, you know, there's no doubt, like now I'm just not going to miss out on those kind of things. You know, I do a lot of training on, on off the court as well. So. So we're looking at the accolades in pickleball, 58 medals, 43 golds and 25 tournaments for the stats that I saw, which is just a remarkable clip. Uh, and then in, you know, starting in 2022, you start this NPL, the national pickleball league with Rick Witzkin and Michael Chen. Uh, what was the uh, thought process there? It seems like it's, it's a great way to you know get everybody active and also show high level pickleball regardless of age but what went into the founding of this successful league well let's see um basically there was you know this idea of major league pickleball that kind of happened for the younger pros and there was there was sort of a rumor that maybe there would be you know 
a fun team thing started for this, the champions pros as well. And then we kind of felt like that wasn't happening. The word was, it wasn't going to happen. We're like, well, we want to do fun stuff too. Like we want to be on a team. And so we just thought, well, why don't we do it? And so really that was all it was. We just thought that would be super fun. And, you know, a lot of us like had played college sports and remembered like Rick Witzkin, you know, my partner, he, he played at Alabama. He was an all American there in tennis and, um, you know, his brother, Todd, was with me at USC, his late brother, Todd, who I think was number one in the world in doubles as well. Um, so Rick and I, you know, we're like, this this could be really fun. And, and Michael really had a great business background. He's also a senior pro, you know, that we had known. And I think the three of us just thought, you know, let's let's give it a shot. And, and uh, you know, I think we could get between us being a couple of the top players, you know, get a core group of other great players to join in and we got the facility at chicken and pickle last year and they were awesome partners for us. We held our, all our events there at different cities, um, yeah. chicken and pickles. And so, you know, ended up selling six teams, um, six awesome, you know, entrepreneurial groups that were willing mm -hmm. to take the plunge with us. And, and now, you know, we're expanding again and um, for our 2024 season. Yeah, the money is, I mean, if you want to look at it from a business side, the money is pouring into pickleball. So it shows you that there's success there. And uh, there's 12 teams. Uh, reading them off quickly, Austin, Boca Raton, Denver, Indianapolis, Naples, Oklahoma City, where you play, mm -hmm. Coachella Valley, Columbus, Houston, Kansas City, Princeton, New Jersey, and Seattle. Uh, we got a draft that's, uh, you know, they're going to draft players, they're going to do things. And we were talking before, everybody's, you know, up for grabs. So even the best like yourself, Anyone could be drafted. It's got to be kind of exciting to know that uh, you're going to have a new set of teammates in a new landscape. I know it's super exciting. I mean, we're all we're all very excited about the draft, and um, you know, there was there was a question, you know, out there: where are we going to keep keep keepers, so to speak, from last season? And um, we ended up, you know, everybody kind of voted and decided we we're going to put everybody on the draft, including the amazing, you know, new players that we have. So everybody's up for grabs. Um, I think there'll be keepers potentially going forward, you know, for 2025. I think that's something that's going to be new, but, um, you know, we have such, we, we basically have like almost every, every single top player. We're, we're ecstatic about it. So really looking forward to seeing yeah. who falls where. Yeah. And the combines that you guys have run, I think it's a great uh, concept too, to try to make it as fair as possible to see the talent, but the talent is, is booming. And, you know, and an aside too, Beth, there's not a lot of leagues in sports in general that can put on senior or older leagues. And I think pickleball is in rarefied air in that regard. It's, it's got the demand because it's got so many people of that age demographic that love the sport. Yeah. I think we, last year um, we did the first ever combine and we think we don't know, but I don't know of any other 50 and over or like, you know, senior kind of group that had a combine and people were like kind of joking, like, oh, are they going to like do high jumps and like four forties and, you know, run 50 yard dashes and things like that. And um, that's not really it. It's more of just like a little bit of a tournament scene where everybody plays with, you know, different partners and, but it's, but all the teams come, the owners, you know, have their clipboards out there. They're, they're noting who's winning. There's noting, they're meeting the people, you know, seeing who they think would be a good fit for their, you know, their culture that they establish on their team. And, um, you know, it's, it's last year, I think we had about a, let's see, I think we had about 80 or a hundred people. And this year we had, wow. we couldn't even fit everybody in the two combines. We had over, you know, 220 people or something and, and some that still didn't make it in. Um, so I think a lot of people are excited. And one thing I wanted to say, like, just about, you know, the draft and the combines is like, it's, it's very hard, you know, at any age to try out for something, right? Like, I mean, that, you know, you could feel like you're going to fail if you don't make it. But I just think yeah. all these people have so much courage to like get out there and say, you know what, I want to try and I might not make it, but I want to try and I want to go compete. And um, so I just give a lot of credit to the people who are willing to, to you know, take that jump, throw their name in the yeah. hat and, um, and just say, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to see, you know, I, I'm going to compete too. I'm not, you know, I'm not you know, banished to the couch yet. Like I've still got some, you know, good competing in me. And, and so I, I really appreciate and applaud all the people that, you know, are, are taking a chance on us. You put yourself out there. It's very brave. It's very courageous. And it shows the, the type of league that your organization is by fostering that and not, you know, belittling people that might not have the goods of other professionals. Of so of course. a very, very commendable, a uh, Beth Bell, Bellamy wrapping up here on tennis channel inside and had to bring up 
some of the interesting fun stuff. Uh, it is another accomplishment too, having four sons that all went division one for tennis. Now there's a lot of different, you know, schools. We got a couple of USC, UCLA, Loyola Marymount, but four for four for D1 scholarships. That's pretty impressive. Yeah. Well, I, I'm not going to say they all got scholarships. The men's is a little tougher than that, but definitely, yeah. um, one of my kids got an academic scholarship. So that was pretty awesome. But, um, yeah, no, they all played two at UCLA, one at LMU, and my oldest, Robbie, at USC, where he won a national championship. So that was that was pretty exciting too. Um, you know, kind of since you know having done that myself, that was really cool to see him have that experience. But um, yeah, busy busy with the kids. A um, lot of junior tennis, a lot of college tennis, and so the the pickleball kind of came in at the right time when. Uh, when my kids were, you know, kind of heading out on out of the out of the nest, so to speak. Yeah. What what type of uh, tennis mom were you? Were you very nervous? Were you just like locked into the match? Did you have to maybe walk around? Because I know there's different ways to handle the stresses of I, your child being there. Yeah, I I mean, I definitely would get nervous. I think it's it's like ignorance is bliss, you know. Like, and so yeah. the more that you know, like I'll, I'll I'll contrast that to watching my one son who loved basketball and he played in a basketball league. I was the happiest basketball mom. I don't even know how to, I didn't know how, to, what offs. I don't know what any <laughs> rules are in basketball. I was like the greatest. I was like, this is so much fun. Yeah. Where are we going for pizza afterwards? Awesome. And with tennis, I was like, you know, internally, I mean, both my husband who, you know, we both know about tennis yeah. and we'd sit there, we'd try not to be negative, but you're, you're just, it's hard not to, you know, use your adult brain on kids tennis. You know, it's not, you know, they don't have the same level of, just thought processes and experiences we do, obviously. So you try not to, to put that standard on them. But I think, you know, when expectations get higher, it, it's definitely more stressful. And so when it's just all for fun, it's it's easier. But I, I can only imagine, like, I mean, I remember, you know, watching like some of the Olympic parents watching their like gymnast daughter, they'd flash to them. I'd be like, and they'd all be hanging on to each other, you know, onto their husband and like super scared and I can't even imagine, you know, that kind of stuff, but, but, you know, in the end it is still just a sport. And I think it was, you know, benefited my kids to, I, I felt like if they could do this, they can do anything. It was such a good growing experience for all of them. Yeah. I wanted to, uh, you know, commend you for that. And also the fact that, yeah, your husband, Steve Bellamy, founder of tennis channel. So, uh, I personally thank him for, <laughs> you know, this and everything that we have here, but, uh, it is a very, it is a very big tennis family and uh, it's good to see that you know, in your case, and in the case of a lot of adults that maybe didn't have a professional career in sports, but they can find fulfillment competing the older that they get. So I think that's just a really cool thing. And this National Pickleball League is good to get people active and competing still. Yeah, no, it is. We love we love getting people, you know, out there and, and uh, encouraging everybody just to be active. And we're really excited, like I said, about the draft and, and then our upcoming season. Um, I think it's going to be a lot of excitement. Well, Beth Bellamy, this was a, a very fun chat. I appreciate you coming on the podcast, Tennis Channel Inside, and best of luck this year and beyond. Whatever team you're on, we don't know yet. So we'll keep our ears, ears glued and uh, just listening to what we see. But uh, also want to wish you a happy uh, early-ish birthday. And I know that because that's we have a lot in common, right? We have the Ohio roots, you know, big interest in racket sports. And also, we also have uh, May 28th in common, too. Oh, wait, is your birthday also May 28th? Oh my gosh. Okay, yes, sorry. Yes, it it froze for a second. Oh, that's awesome. Well, yeah. <laughs> Happy birthday to you too as well. Yeah. yeah. So I, I had to get that in there. We don't have a, we have, you know, a couple of celebrities here and there, you know, Jerry West, Gladys Knight, some other names, but uh, <laughs> have the idea in the list. Uh, Beth Bellamy, Bellamy, a very, very thank you. A very sincere thank you for joining the podcast. This was fun. Yeah. Best of luck going forward. And thanks for coming on Tennis Channel Inside Then. Thank you so much for having me.